Welcome to Orthodoxy and Heterodoxy, a podcast dedicated to navigating the way to Christ through the complicated religious landscape of the modern world. Join your host, Father Andrew Stephen Damick, as we explore this landscape in the light of the Orthodox Christian faith. Here's Father Andrew. We're going to begin our presentation on Pentecostalism with some quotations. This first one is from Charles Parham, written sometime around 1900 or 1901. He distinctly made it clear to me that he raised me up and trained me to declare this mighty truth to the world. And if I was willing to stand for it with all the persecutions, hardships, trials, slander, scandal that it would entail, he would give me the blessing. And I said, Lord, if you will just give me this blessing. Right then there came a slight twist in my throat. A glory fell over me and I began to worship God in the Swedish tongue, which later changed to other languages and continued so until the morning. This next one is from the periodical The Apostolic Faith in its very first volume from September 1906. Proud, well-dressed preachers come in to investigate. Soon their high looks are replaced with wonder, then conviction comes, and very often you will find them in a short time wallowing on the dirty floor, asking God to forgive them and make them as little children. It would be impossible to state how many have been converted, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. They have been and are daily going out to all points of the compass to spread this wonderful gospel. And then finally from Kenneth Hagin, written in 1979. Then the Lord Jesus himself appeared to me. I saw him as clearly as I would see you. He stood within three feet of me. He discussed things concerning my ministry and finances and even discussed things concerning our United States government. All of these things came to pass just as he said they would. He concluded by exhorting me, be faithful and fulfill thy ministry, my son, for the time is short. Pentecostalism is more about religious experience than about specific doctrinal developments, though it does, of course, have its peculiar doctrines. Now, I'll be using the term Pentecostalism here to refer not only to the early Pentecostals or to denominations that use the word in their name, but also to the movement and offshoots related to it. We will therefore be giving more weight to the history of the movement because it's about experience than perhaps any other group we cover in these talks. I'm doing this here because even though Pentecostalism is generally regarded as a Protestant movement, I believe that it may represent a new kind of Christianity, perhaps even a fourth variety after Orthodoxy, Catholicism, and Protestantism. And so if we spend more time on history in this talk, we should remember also that we had the previous three talks to develop the history of the mainstream Protestant movements, as well as noting that Pentecostalism's history and inner character are fairly unknown to most Christians. So I hope you'll forgive me for spending more time on story here and bear with me before we get to the specifically comparative portions of this presentation. The beginnings of Pentecostalism lie in the holiness movement, which arose mainly out of 19th century Methodism. Understanding the holiness background of Pentecostalism especially in terms of its historical journey, is critical to understanding Pentecostalism itself. So even though we covered the movement in the previous presentation, we'll return to some of its themes here as a kind of prologue, especially those that point toward Pentecostalism. And I should note that I'm especially indebted in this presentation to Robert Mapes Anderson's book, Vision of the Disinherited, The Making of American Pentecostalism. And I'll be quoting from it frequently. It was in the holiness movement that personal experience of the Holy Spirit came to be especially emphasized. And those experiences coalesced into the doctrine of the second work of grace, or the second blessing. It was this second blessing experience that enabled holiness believers to live out their desire for a return to strict moral teaching in keeping with revivalist themes of Christian renewal. The experience was identified with the entire sanctification doctrine that had been taught by Methodist founder John Wesley, a doctrine similar in some ways to the Orthodox teaching on theosis. 
Wesley's doctrine was especially concerned with the removal of sin from the Christian. Two of the founders of the holiness movement, Phoebe Palmer and her husband, Dr. Walter Palmer, began to hold meetings in Phoebe's sister home in New York City. It was during one of those meetings in 1837 that Phoebe Palmer claimed to experience entire sanctification, and she emerged as a leader in the movement. In time, her meetings were attended by Methodist bishops and hundreds of clergy and laity. In parallel to Phoebe Palmer's experience in 1836, the year before, Asa Mahan, a Calvinist and then president of Oberlin College, said that he experienced a baptism with the Holy Spirit, which took away all his desire and tendency towards sin. Charles G. Finney, who was associated with Oberlin, recognized in this teaching the solution to a practical problem he had seen in revival meetings, a genuine conversion experience followed by a lapse back into sinful ways of living. Yet while Finney's strand of revivalism interpreted entire sanctification in terms of a total consecration to social activism, holiness preachers were especially concerned with the possibilities for actual sinlessness during the earthly life. Throughout the middle of the 19th century, similar experiences of a second blessing were also reported among other Protestant denominations. Thus, the fervor of revivalism's emphasis on conversion came also to be attached to the second blessing. Conversion to Christ was not enough. There needed to be another major spiritual moment for the believer. He also had to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Holiness preachers thus came to teach the necessity for a second blessing given to Christians, the first blessing being conversion to Christ. This experience was taught to grant a full purification from sin including the tendency to sin, enabling the believer theoretically to live a sinless life. The doctrine was defined as follows by the First General Holiness Assembly in Chicago in May 1885. They said this, Entire sanctification, more commonly designated as sanctification, holiness, Christian perfection, or perfect love, represents that second definite stage in Christian experience wherein by baptism with the Holy Spirit, administered by Jesus Christ, and received instantaneously by faith, the justified believer is delivered from inbred sin and consequently is saved from all unholy tempers, cleansed from all moral defilement, made perfect in love, and introduced into full and abiding fellowship with God. The belief in the second blessing is what especially characterized the holiness movement. But the movement also carried with it a literal-minded focus on the scripture. Emotionalist fervor and piety and worship, strict moralism expressed especially as separatism from the world, and an enmity for the traditional institutions of religion. All of these features were inherited in Pentecostalism and remain integral to it. In addition to these characteristics, the holiness movement also is the context for the devotion to supernatural wonders that had emerged during the Second Great Awakening. Although it is Pentecostalism that is most associated in our own day with strong emotional fervor and the belief in frequent supernatural signs from God, it was not unusual during the late 19th century to see scenes like these in the holiness movement. Described by Mary B. Woodworth Eder in her memoirs, she writes, Men, women, and children were struck down in their homes, in their places of business, on the highways, and lay as dead. They had wonderful visions, and arose converted, giving glory to God. The power of God fell on the multitude. Many fell to the ground. Others stood with their faces and hands raised to heaven. The Holy Ghost sat upon them. Others shouted, some talked, others wept aloud. Sinners were converted and began to testify and praise God. I was overpowered and carried to my tent. Several spake very intelligently in other languages as the Spirit gave them utterance. The movement initially proved to be a boon to the Methodist Church, whose leaders sought to tap into the new enthusiasm. In the decades that followed, however, many holiness believers left the denomination and others because of its perceived compromise with the world, particularly in its dedication to the temporal reforms of the social gospel. 
Methodism had grown too affluent, established, and focused on social reform to remain a natural home for those focused on achieving sinless perfection in opposition to the world. Various holiness denominations emerged, though many independent congregations also formed, all motivated by the desire to come out from the world, which is a phrase often associated with the established denominations. The feeling that the established denominations had embraced apostasy and worldliness grew. And perhaps in response to that feeling, within the holiness movement, a powerful millenarianism began to emerge. Perhaps this was the great falling away that had been predicted in Scripture that would precede the end of the world. Believers thought that Jesus was going to return to earth soon. Not just the soon that Christians had always held to in a sense, but soon in a sense of nearly any minute. Eschatological expectation heightened. The end of the world was coming, or at least the end of the order Christians had been accustomed to for centuries. The rapid changes brought on by the Industrial Revolution, the great population shifts from rural areas into the cities, and various wars that took place throughout the world in the late 19th and early 20th centuries all contributed to the feeling among holiness revivalists that the end was truly near. God was about to do something big. That something big found its voice, especially in a variant on the holiness movement that pointed toward an imminent end of the current age. Most holiness believers believed that supernatural manifestations were a normal part of the Christian life. And so what they were experiencing was, in some sense, a restoration of what was seen in the New Testament. But a movement arose strongly influenced by revival meetings held in Keswick, England, that suggested something bigger was happening. The well-known American revivalist Dwight L. Moody visited England and spoke at revivals in Keswick, where those assembled generally accepted the dispensationalist framework of John Nelson Darby, which we discussed in our previous presentations, particularly his assertion that God set up different historical dispensations under which the rules for mankind's relationship with God differed. And not only did they accept this framework, but they had a sense that a new dispensation was about to begin. And the proof of this would be a worldwide outbreak of revival, making it finally possible for every living person to have the opportunity to convert to Christ. Another of the proponents of the Keswick teachings, which came to be known as the Higher Life Movement, was C.I. Schofield, author of the famous Schofield Reference Bible, which left the mark of dispensationalism deeply on Pentecostalism. The Dake Study Bible also did this, by the way. Schofield believed that an age of the Holy Spirit was beginning to dawn. He wrote this. We are in the midst of a marked revival of interest in the person and work of the Holy Spirit. More books, Booklets and tracts upon that subject have issued from the press during the last 80 years than in all previous times since the invention of printing. Indeed, within the last 20 years, more has been written and said upon the doctrine of the Holy Spirit than in the preceding 1800 years. Many of these works speak of new Pentecosts. The prophecy of Joel 2.28 that predicted a pouring out of the Spirit accompanied by miraculous prophecies, dreams, and visions, was being reapplied. Not only did it refer to the first Pentecost, as interpreted in Acts 2.17, but this act of outpouring was being repeated with a second. And we see this being done again in the third wave Pentecostalism that began in the 1980s. Combined with Finney and Mahan's teachings that sanctification was more about empowerment than about sinlessness, the influence of the Keswick movement now set the stage of the belief that not only was a page of history about to turn, but God was about to give a new blessing of power to Christians for the purpose of a final worldwide evangelistic revival. Anderson writes that the Keswick group rejected the orthodox holiness contention that sanctification and baptism in the Holy Spirit were one and the same experience 
Rather, they believed sanctification to be a lifelong process of increasing growth and grace that began at conversion but was never completed and held that baptism in the Spirit was a separate endowment of power. Some began to speak of a blessing beyond the second blessing, a third blessing that granted supernatural power. Others held that it was the second blessing that granted this power. Whatever the case, the stage was now set for the development of a religious movement driven by the experience of the latter rain, a new outpouring of the Holy Spirit on Christians, a new Pentecost. In its first edition, dated September 1906, the periodical The Apostolic Faith, with a story headlined, Pentecost Has Come, declared this of Los Angeles, California. The power of God now has this city agitated as never before. Pentecost has surely come, and with it the Bible evidences are following. Many being converted and sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues as they did on the day of Pentecost. The scenes that are daily enacted in the building on Azusa Street and at missions and churches in other parts of the city are beyond description and the real revival has only started as God has been working with his children mostly, getting them through to Pentecost and laying the foundation for a mighty wave of salvation among the unconverted. Periodical is speaking of the famous Azusa Street Revival that began April 9th, 1906, and continued for some nine years following. This revival is largely regarded as the beginning of Pentecostalism, but as we have seen, most of the basic ingredients were in place for the rise of Pentecostalism in the holiness movement prior to the Azusa mission. The culture of the movement made for fertile ground for the cultivation of this new kind of Christianity and intense emotional Christianity filled with a sense of the supernatural. Anderson writes this. To the absolutist mentality of many holiness people, all compromise was sin, organization was ecclesiasticism or churchianity, and any restraint in worship was quenching the spirit. None of this could be countenanced by the true believer. Thus, within the holiness movement was lodged a growing body of discontented true believers, some in the holiness denominations, most in tiny associations or independent churches and missions, all determined to press on for still newer horizons of spiritual experience, for them only a dramatic Christianity of intense emotion could be satisfied. Those who have studied the history of Pentecostalism usually know something about the Azusa revival. But what is perhaps less well known is what came immediately before it. The man who sparked the Azusa revival was William Seymour. But Seymour was actually not the originator of the experience that began in the spring of 1906 in Los Angeles. Seymour was in fact presenting a simplified version of the doctrines and practices he had learned in Houston, Texas, from a man named Charles Fox Parham. Parham's critical role in the early history of Pentecostalism was obscured for decades for most of his fellow Pentecostals because of personal failings and scandals that undermined his credibility. He was, for instance, arrested in 1907 on charges of sodomy, which were later dropped. He exhibited racism, even becoming involved with the Ku Klux Klan. This racism, of course, was ironic, considering that his most successful student was black. And he was also accused of financial improprieties. Further, the complexity and novelty of some of his teachings made them difficult to pass on. For example, he taught that God had created two human races, the sons of God and the Adamic race, those descended from Adam. Cain was a member of the latter, but married one of the former, and interracial marriage was thus condemned by Parham. And the reason that Noah was spared from the flood was because he was a pure descendant of Adam. He also taught a form of British Israelism, the belief that the people of the British Isles are direct descendants of the ten lost tribes of Israel. Despite these problems, however, Parham's influence in Pentecostalism's beginnings through Seymour was profound. 
His most significant contribution to the genesis of Pentecostalism was the teaching that speaking in tongues was the Bible evidence of the second blessing experience of baptism in the Holy Spirit. In 1900, Parham set up a small school called the College of Bethel on the outskirts of Topeka, Kansas, where he aims to teach the Bible and search for the true baptism in the Spirit, which he believed that no one in the holiness movement had yet found. Several rooms at the school were also set up as a healing home where the sick could come for faith healing. The students at his school were largely former ministers or religious workers from a variety of denominational or independent church backgrounds. All shared Parham's association with the holiness movement and, like Parham, sought a new experience of the Holy Spirit, a new power for the purposes of evangelism. They shared all things in common, maintained a continuous prayer vigil with three-hour shifts, prayed and fasted together, held services at night, and conducted door-to-door canvassing of homes in the area during the day. While there, Parham taught his students that the second blessing they had likely experienced before was merely a form of sanctification or the anointing that abideth, and that they should still seek for the true baptism in the Spirit. It was during his time in Topeka that Parham presided over a moment that is one of the traditional historical markers for the beginning of Pentecostalism. Before departing for three days of preaching in Kansas City in late December 1900, Parham directed his students to spend time alone studying Acts 2, saying this to them, The gifts are in the Holy Spirit, and with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the gifts, as well as the graces, should be manifested. Now, students, while I am gone, see if there is not some evidence given of the baptism, so there may be no doubt on the subject. It's clear from his directions how he intended his students to be thinking that the miraculous signs seen in Acts 2 would properly accompany the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It would not be surprising if they all reported similar conclusions on his return. And sure enough, Parham said that that's that's what happened. He wrote this, To my astonishment, they all had the same story that while there were different things occurred when the Pentecostal blessing fell, that the indisputable proof on each occasion was that they spake with other tongues. A close examination of the testimonies of Parham and two other students who kept diaries of their own suggests that the traditional story of multiple simultaneous independent experiences of tongue speaking was not what actually happened. Parham himself had probably believed for some time that speaking in tongues was evidence of the baptism of the Spirit, and accounts of other eyewitnesses to the events around the turn of that new year strongly suggest that it was an experience passed on from one student to another, rather than something that happened independently. One student, Howard Stanley, bore witness to this learning. He wrote, Agnes Osmond was the one that made clear to me that when we were filled with the Holy Spirit, that we would speak in other tongues. In other words, they learned this from each other. Parham claimed an ecstatic experience of speaking Swedish, while Agnes Osmond both spoke and wrote in Chinese and other languages after Parham laid hands on her. Howard Stanley wrote that he saw cloven tongues as of fire come into the meeting room, descending and enabling him to speak another language, something he saw others doing as well. Those assembled all sang, Jesus, lover of my soul, in at least six different languages, while surrounded by a miraculous glow of white light. Parham's telling of the story is very much reminiscent of the narrative in Acts 2. It was January 3rd, 1901, their second Pentecost had come. And the defection of one of their members a week later, S.J. Higgins, who told a local newspaper that the school was a fake, introduced the movement to the press. Soon, reporters arrived from Kansas City, St. Louis, Cincinnati, and other cities, all writing about the curious religious movement near Topeka. One article even included a transcript of the tongue-speaking of Parham's sister-in-law, Lillian Thistlethwaite, with the public eye on the Parham School of Tongues, as some were calling it. Despite some initial setbacks, 
the movement began planning campaigns across the country. You've been listening to Orthodoxy and Heterodoxy, hosted by Father Andrew Stephen Damick. Father Andrew is the pastor of St. Paul Antiochian Orthodox Church in Emmaus, Pennsylvania, and the author of the books Orthodoxy and Heterodoxy, An Introduction to God, and the forthcoming Bearing God, all from Ancient Faith Publishing. This has been a listener-supported presentation of Ancient Faith Radio. Oh.